Good evening and welcome. My name is Vicki Studi. I'm the president of the Dakota County Regional Chamber. Committed to business for you, your chamber unites businesses by influencing public policy, influencing economic development, and providing networking and professional development opportunities. Representing more than 500 members in the area, the chamber is an influential voice to champion economic growth for business. As citizens of this great community and nation, we have the right to cast our vote each November for individuals that represent our interests, leaders you can elect that make decisions that affect your job, your health care, energy costs, security, and much more. Tonight's candidate forum is just one opportunity to educate and engage voters. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's timekeeper, Cindy Haas. Cindy is Vice President of Private Banking at Gateway Bank and serves as the Chamber's Chair of the Board. She's actively engaged in the local community. In terms of the rules for this evening, all seats have been assigned in a predetermined order. Each candidate will be given one minute for opening comments. Cindy will hold a yellow card indicating when you have 15 seconds remaining. She will hold a red stop card when the time is up. If you do not stop when the red stop card is held, a bell will ring and you will be cut off from your comments. You are encouraged to stop when the red card is held and we would appreciate not having to ring the bell this evening. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to each question. A candidate can use less than one minute, of course, when answering, but cannot exceed one minute. Time starts upon the completion of the questions. The order of the candidates to answer the questions will alternate within each race and then when each new question is asked. Due to time limitations for our replay, we may show we may decrease the amount of time to less than one minute for our final question. For those of you in this evening's audience, if you have a question, we would ask that you complete a note card located at the podium over on the right hand side of the room. Please ensure that the questions are addressed to all candidates and within one hour within this forum, we may not be able to answer or ask all of the questions, but we will do our very best. Finally, each candidate will have one minute to provide a closing statement. This evening, we are here to learn from our candidates running in Minnesota's Legislative District 58, which covers the communities of Farmington and Lakeville, along with the townships and cities as far reaching as Hastings and Northfield. It is my pleasure to introduce our candidates. In Senate 58, District 58, we have candidates Tim Pitcher and Matt Little running for an open seat. Our candidates in House 58A include Leanne Weichel and incumbent John Kosnick. Leanne, and finally, running in House District 58B, please welcome incumbent Pat Graffalo, along with his opponent, Marla Vatz. We will start with opening comments through a rotation that begins with our, our Senate <coughs> district with Tim Pitcher leading us. Tim? Great, thank you very much. My name is Tim Pitcher. I'm the Republican endorsed candidate for State Senate in Senate District 58. I've lived in Lakeville and Farmington for over 22 years and I'm a current Farmington City Council member. I've had a highly innovative career of 32 years developing high-tech microelectronic circuits for our national defense, but mainly for implantable pacemakers and defibrillators, saving hundreds of thousands of people's lives worldwide. I have a 28-year-old daughter who's a pharmacy technician. I have two stepdaughters, Rathmini and Rutina, and my wife, Cheng, who is a Cambodian Holocaust survivor. I've door knocked thousands of doors around our district, and the overwhelming Comments that people are saying to me is that they're overtaxed and there's too much waste in government. While our Republican ideals do work, we do need real tax relief and reform for the middle class. We care, our ideals work, and we will lead. Thank you. Matt, welcome. Thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Matt Little. I uh, was born and raised in Lakeville and have had the privilege of serving as the mayor of my hometown for the last four years. I want to thank the chamber for hosting this forum and for everybody coming out at 8.30 on a Wednesday night. That's much appreciated. I'm running for state senate because we have to change the way we're doing politics in St. Paul. 
the hyperpartisan battles we've been seeing have done nothing to serve the people of Minnesota. We need a new kind of practical politics, one that's not obsessed with party or labels, but is focused on getting the job done. That's the approach I've taken as mayor, and it's resulted in double-digit job growth, record-breaking business development, and we've built more single-family homes in, in, than any other city in the entire state of Minnesota for the last three years. Not to mention, we have some of the lowest per capita taxes in all of Dakota County. If elected to the Senate, I'll focus on growing jobs, improving infrastructure, and rebuilding a world-class education system. I'll ensure our seniors can age in place and that our veterans are taken care of. Thank you. Next, we'll move to John and Leanne. And John, if you could go first. Great, thank you. My name is John Kosnick. I'm the Republican endorsed candidate for the House seat. And it's been an honor to serve you as your state representative for the last two years. I've enjoyed meeting many of you uh, of, in Lakeville at your homes and throughout the city. I thank you for the privilege to represent you. I've worked hard to honor your trust, uh, focusing on the issues that unite us and the values that we share together. I'm proud to represent the best of Lakeville. I was born in Columbia, a country that doesn't have the same promise or the hope that we have here in the United States. When I was five years old, my mom died, but fortunately I was adopted by an American family and have been blessed in many, many ways. I may, I've been able to realize the freedoms and the opportunities that we have here in America. Still today, because of higher taxes and increasing regulation, it's getting harder to achieve our dreams and to do better than the generation before us. Even as we've recovered from the Great Recession, there are families and businesses that are still struggling. I ask uh, for your vote. My name is John Kosnick. Thank you, John. Leanne? Good evening. I am Leanne Weichel. I am a teacher. I have 22 bright-eyed, eager students that greet me every morning. These are, this is our future. These kids are our 21st workforce that we're trying to educate. I am married to Dean. He's the handsome man in the green shirt right there. We just celebrated our 32nd anniversary. We have two daughters, Sian and Corey. They're Panthers. Gotta say go Panthers, but I appreciate Cougars too. They received a first-class education in the state of Minnesota. They graduated 05 and 06. One of them is a Navy lieutenant. She serves our country. She served two, two tours in the Middle East. She's currently on a, as a Navy Reserve officer going back to school to get PT so she can help. My other daughter is an equally successful adult. They're a result of a community that worked together through coaches, our churches, and specifically our education. That's not possible today for many kids, and I want to change that. Thank you. Pat, we'll go to you next. Uh, Welcome. Thank, thank you, and uh, good evening to everyone present, also those watching remotely. Uh, my name is Pat Garofalo. It's my honor to serve as a state representative for the city of Farmington and the portions of rural Dakota and Goodhue counties that are in Legislative District 58B. Uh, I think it's important to provide a quick update on what happened this last legislative session. Something that I'm very proud of is for the first time in our state's history, I'm proud of the fact that we are now exempting veterans' pensions 100% from taxation. Uh, now those who have served our country are no longer going to have their pensions taxed in Minnesota. That's a good uh, reform. I'm glad we did it. It keeps those veterans here active and involved in our community. I'm also proud to have been the chief author of substantial uh, business tax relief so that virtually every business in Minnesota is now paying less than unemployment insurance taxes. But I'd be lying to you if I told you that everything was peaches and cream. Unfortunately, at the end of the legislative session, even though there was broad agreement on the need for funding for roads as well as tax relief, uh, unfortunately, those things didn't happen. And they happened for one reason and one reason only. And that is because Democrats insisted on a train. And their response was that without a train, there was going to be no tax relief. I disagree about that. I uh, wish we would get that funded. And my time is up. <laughs> Marla, welcome. Thank you. I'm Marla Vatz, and I am running to be your representative in 58B. I have been uh, in Farmington and a resident of Farmington for 25 years. I have five kids, and they're all uh, grown adults, I'm happy to say. Um, about six years ago, I lost my husband, and that caused my life uh, to change uh, completely. Uh, I decided to fight for what I, what I have a passion for, and that is 
to help the people of this district, to help the people who are struggling to try and get ahead and help them do that. I've been a contract negotiator for 16 years, and I don't get to choose who I sit across the table with, but I do have to negotiate and I do have to close the deal. If I don't close the deal, then I have not done my job. So in the last legislative session, that job wasn't done. Sitting down, acting like a community, and working out our problems, and coming up with real solutions is the way to go, and I will do that. Thank you. We'll start our first question with Leanne. What is the biggest challenge facing the state of Minnesota in the next two years, and how would you address it if elected? I think the biggest ch challenge facing our, is what happened in our government in the last two years. The lack of a, an ability to collaborate, find common goals, and come to common sense solutions to do that. I've had the privilege of being a leader in my district in a collaboration that allowed our students to, we rewrote curriculum and they're top five in science and math. At the same time, our, our collaboration saved our taxpayers $500,000 along with um, achieving a federal award called the Green Ribbon Award from our president. I got to go to Washington, D.C. and accept that. And it took a teacher working with a school board member and our district office staff with a common goal and saying we all have different things that matter to us, but we can find a common solution and actually getting the work done. John? Thank you. Uh, I see the next challenge uh, for the next biennium is going to be uh, to pass another budget. Uh, Republicans and Democrats worked very hard. We got our job done, and we were successful in the, uh, passing a budget in 15 that uh, held the rate of growth to the third lowest in 50 years. Uh, we also passed a transportation plan, a bonding bill, and tax relief. Uh, the tax bill passed with 90%. The bonding bill required over 60% of the legislature to vote on. Uh, the problem is Governor Dayton. You can talk about nonpartisanship, and for the most part uh, at the Capitol, I've been Happy to have relationships with uh, many Democrats across the aisle, and we've worked together. The problem is Governor Dayton, and if uh, you want more uh, functioning government, it's time to make sure that the House is reelected, the House Republican majority, so that we can stand up to Governor Dayton. But we also need help uh, with the liberals and the Democrats in the Senate uh, because we can't get uh, Governor Dayton uh, rid of him for two more years. Thank you, Marla. We'll go to you next. I, I would agree with Leanne. I think our biggest challenge is not sitting down and talking about things and coming up with a solution. Uh, there, is no, there is no way that we can all sit on opposite sides of the room and expect to come up with a solution. That won't happen. We have to think about the people in our districts. I've been on the doors. I've been talking to people. They are frustrated. And it is time for us to do the grown-up thing and sit down and make some real things that are going to help our people, help our constituents, and help them start, you know, be able to go forward and live better lives. They're, they're, most of those people have not had a raise in a very long time. Most of those people are, are trying to still dig out. And if we don't offer them something in the way of being a leader, uh, then we're not doing our job. Pat, biggest challenge? Uh, 24 of the last 26 years in the state of Minnesota, we've had shared government. And that involves having Democrats and Republicans work together. And it's worked pretty well for our state. Uh, the exception to that is the two years of 2013 and 2014 when the Democrats had total control of our state. And that was a political equivalent of girls gone wild. It was completely crazy. We got the Minsure disaster, attempts to unionize home-based daycare businesses, and worst of all, a $90 million luxury office building for politicians that we really didn't need. So going forward, I think it's important that we have that shared government and collaboration. But I also think it's important that voters understand there's a difference between the stated goals of elected officials and the real goals. And as we go forward here, I look forward to having that conversation and highlighting those. 
that when we hear Democrats talking about listening and understanding, um, there is no dispute about it. Uh, there was bipartisan support for tax relief this year, as well as bipartisan support for road and bridge funding. But we were taken hostage by the Democrats who insisted on a train. And now, even though they funded that train, we still can't get the, uh, the governor to call a special session. So I look forward to kind of separating the stated from the uh, real agenda later on this evening. Matt, biggest challenge facing Minnesota over the next two years? I think all the biggest challenges we face do stem from a lack of practical politics. Uh, we're hearing tonight two different narratives about what's going on in St. Paul, but we're hearing a single type of rhetoric, which is the use of labels and blame. Um, you know, Hubert Humphrey had a great uh, quote in his day, and he said, uh, to err is human, uh, but to blame is politics. And that's what we're hearing tonight is blame. Um, it, people have to work together at the Capitol. And there's two major things that aren't getting done because of this politics, which is uh, we're not ready for the age wave. Minnesota is going to get much older. We need to ensure seniors can age in place by providing some sort of transportation infrastructure to get them around. We need to work on workforce issues so that there are enough caregivers. Uh, second, we do need a bonding bill to fix our aging infrastructure. Places like Denison can't even afford a sewer pump uh, unless we pass a bonding bill. So uh, we've got to go to St. To Paul and change the way we're doing politics. Yeah. Well, one of the things I believe is uh, most important is education. We need schools of excellence that can pre prepare all kids for success. We need school choice. All children learn differently. And to be able to actually get together and do this, I have a, a very unique background for over 20 years, solid. I had to get people together from all different aspects of a company and conduct what's called peer reviews. I had to take an input from every single part to be able to put everything all together to make, for instance, the latest and greatest pacemaker to save hundreds of thousands of people's lives and it had to be done correctly. You have to take input from everybody and go the best path forward without compromising your values. And this would work fantastically up in our state capital. So I am very uniquely qualified for that for a very, very long period of time. Moving on to our next question, we'll start with Pat. How should Minnesota address its unmet transportation needs in the near future, including any funding mechanisms? Also, do you support raising the metro area sales tax to fund investment in transit in the metro area? Well, first of all, I want to thank our Dakota County Commissioners, particularly Commissioner Holberg, Gerlach, and Slavic, for standing up and getting Dakota County out of the county metro area sales tax that's currently in law. Uh, the reason why is that it's a bad deal for us. In fact, it's a bad deal for the region, and I want to thank them for their strong leadership in this matter. Uh, the reality is we had a good transportation plan this year. I uh, passed the legislature, passed both the House, uh, passed the House with strong bipartisan support. It went over to the Senate. And it was about to become law until the Democrats tried tacking on a train. Um, and that's what blew up our transportation bill. And so it's very disappointing to see uh, there seems to be some sort of cognitive dissonance up here among the Democrats that somehow this didn't happen. Um, there was agreement. There was, st was stakeholder involvement. We passed a bill. It was only because uh, Senate Democrats insisted on attaching a train to it that we lost this. In terms of increasing the metro area sales tax, we already have... Uh, a base sales tax of 6.85%. Uh, it's got over 7% in Dakota County right now. The last thing in the world we need to be doing is raising taxes, and I'm opposed to that. Thank you. Marla? Well, I think that was a local control type of issue. They had the option to, to create that sales tax and make that pay for the train. If we would not have done the the issue with the train then we would have paid at way more because we would have lost those federal dollars so that in the end cost us less um, as far as a funding mechanism we, we need to have a long-term transportation plan uh, we cannot do uh, you know we need to look at all things for funding. We cannot take anything off the table, but we also have to think outside the box and not hit the, the easiest thing to come by that we can think of to fund it. But it has to be a long-term plan. It cannot be a gimmick. It cannot be uh, you know, a, a patch here and a patch there that will not work and it's not what we need to do for the Twin Cities. 
Thank you. Tim, transportation needs? Clearly, we do need uh, transportation that is excellent. We need safe roads and bridges. Bus system is fantastic. Seniors need some transportation. Obviously, they're going to have quite a few needs coming up now and in the future. Trains do not work for this. For instance, the North Star Light Rail is subsidized $22 per person per trip from our tax dollars. That is not sustainable, and there's an incredible amount of maintenance that goes along with that. So definitely not for any trains whatsoever, but we do need a really high-quality transportation system. Thank you. Matt. Great. I think I, generally I'm against the a new metro area sales tax. I think uh, Representative Garofalo uh, touched on it, which Democrats and Republicans had agreed on a new funding mechanism. So if that was replicated, uh, I would certainly support any bipartisan agreement on a minimally burdensome uh, funding mechanism for folks uh, using a combination of bonding and the general fund. I think more frustrating for our district is that we send all this money to St. Paul and we don't get a whole heck of a lot of it back. Um, and so if I go to St. Paul, I'm going to focus on transportation needs on I-35. We need a new park and ride, and we need an expanded third lane. I also think we need some significant investment on Highway 3. That road is incredibly dangerous, and the repairs that are being done now don't go far enough to uh, increasing the safety of that road. Um, and I also think farming can, gets left out of discussions uh, on bus transit, which needs significant investment down here as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunities on Highway 3 and Pilot Knob uh, to make that happen. Thank you. John, we'll go to you next. Uh, would you mind repeating the question? Certainly. So I can clarify. How should Minnesota address its unmet transportation needs in the near future, <clears throat> including any funding mechanisms? Also, do you support raising the metro area sales tax to fund investment in transit within the metro area? One of the things that I'm most proud of uh, in my freshman term was standing up against the metro area wide sales tax for transit. It came at the very end of session and uh, was starting to come through. I'm not sure that I heard uh, some of the other um, candidates say if they were supporting light rail or not. I did not support the Southwest light rail. Uh, in terms of the unmet uh, transportation needs, uh, we did have a plan that used current existing revenues uh, over the next 10 years and that, that that did pass the House. I was proud to have a provision in there for the uh, motor vehicle lease tax that would bring about $10 million more to Dakota County for their county road um, system. Uh, another idea um, is that we need to focus on the east-west corridor uh, through Dakota County, uh, not just north and south. Um, I did find it interesting uh, that my opponent had came to the Capitol with the radical idea of bringing light rail even down to Lakeville. So um, I think there is uh, some unmet needs, but certainly light rail to Lakeville is not one of them. Thank you. Leanne? I don't remember coming to your office and asking that. So if you're referring to me, you're thinking of someone else. But since you introduced yourself to me tonight for the first time, I'm pretty sure you're thinking of somebody different. I believe we need mass transit. We have a population, our 20 to 35 year olds, that are seeking a different way of being in life. They look for cities to work in that have mass transit. We have an Air Lake Park that is looking for employees. They can't necessarily afford to live in Lakeville, but they want to work here. We have jobs for them, but we don't have a way and infrastructure in place to get our workers to our jobs. There are 14 Metro mayors and 144 county commissioners that all signed on to the transportation bill, and we didn't get it done. And I believe that that has to happen. Our jobs dependent on it. The Weichel family construction business built many of the buildings in Lakeville, and we can't get workers to them. Thank you. Next question, we will start with Matt. In 2013, the legislature increased the individual income tax rate to the third highest in the nation at 9.85%, affecting many small businesses whose business income is passed through to their individual income taxes. Do you support or oppose reducing pass-through taxes on small and mid-sized Minnesota business owners? Please explain. 
Yeah, I, I don't think any tax scheme is ever going to be perfect. Um, but I think we've got to take a step back and look at how Minnesota is doing. And in fact, our economy is doing pretty well with the system we've set up. Um, business is booming. Uh, people are buying houses again. And I just read an article that wages were even going up in the last year. So something's doing right in Minnesota. Um, but I think more important for folks is whether they're getting value for their taxes. And as I touched on in the last speech, we need our tax dollars to come back here and make investments. Um, and so that's where I stand there. Um, I think it's important that this is not any sort of binary choice that we're making. When we create a tax scheme, it's in the context of a whole package. So to pick and choose one and say yes or no um, doesn't make the most sense. We need to look at the context as a whole and make sure we're getting the best value for our citizens in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Kim? We are clearly overtaxed, and I absolutely support reducing that tax rate. People are fleeing our state. Companies are fleeing our state because of high taxes. Just yesterday afternoon, I talked with three different people at three different homes that are researching going to lower taxed states. That is unacceptable and incorrect. It should not be occurring. We absolutely have to reduce the tax burden on our citizens. When you get to the point where people are leaving our state and we're one of the highest tax states in the entire country, that is absolutely wrong. That needs to change. We want to keep people here. We want to keep our seniors here. And all three of them were seniors. I support not just cutting, absolutely eliminating the Minnesota tax on Social Security. They've already paid tax on that money. It should not be taxed again. Thank you. Move next to Marla. Well, I think when it comes to taxes, we need to look at what we are paying for. If we are paying for an educational system and then the money is not allocated to that educational system, then there's going to be bonds and levies that go on top of that income tax. And that, that is where people are feeling overtaxed because they are paying for the same thing out of two different pockets of the same pair of pants. We need to get value. We need to have our schools have the proper amount of funding so we don't have to go to bonds and levies just to run. We have to have classes that are sustainable and teachable for teachers. We need to invest and that is what we do with our taxes. We invest in our area. Pat? Um, well, I think it's a little disingenuous for Democrats to talk about being fiscally conservative but not answer the question. The question before us is, do you support or repeal this? And the answer to the question is, uh, I am absolutely in favor of repealing this tax increase. It was a bad idea in the last two years. Well over a billion dollars of income has left our state. And it's clear that it has a destructive effect on wealth. Now, the national economy is doing well right now, so we're seeing both Minnesota, Wisconsin, and other states do very well. However, make no mistake about it, wealth is leaving our state. And this is a good opportunity to highlight the stated agenda versus the real agenda. Uh, we hear from our Democrat friends tonight about the need to be pragmatic and to listen. Make no mistake about it. Their goal is to tax more, spend more, and redistribute money, which is a great plan for Iron Range Democrats. It's a really good plan for Minneapolis and St. Paul. But for places like Dakota County, which are viewed as a piggy bank by the Democrat Party, it doesn't work for us. There's a reason why our area has consistently rejected the tax and spend policies of Democrats, and it's simply because they do not reflect the fiscal views of this area. Thank you. Leanne. Can you restate the question, please? Certainly. In 2013, the legislature increased the individual income tax rate to the third highest in the nation at 9.85% affecting many small businesses whose business income is passed through to their individual income taxes. Do you support or oppose reducing pass-through taxes on small and mid-sized Minnesota business, business owners? Please explain. What I support is, along with what N CNBC re has reported about our state, we tend to have higher taxes. 
but we also have one of the best places for business in the nation. The reason we have that is because of our educational system and the quality of life here. I have met many of those people who paid those 1% taxes. They're willing to invest in our state. I, I wouldn't repeal it. I have to be honest about that. But I would make sure our money is spent well. I believe that we need to invest in public education. And we're not doing that and haven't done that for over a decade. And it's affecting our abilities to educate our children. I can't do my job as a first grade teacher. And that needs to change. And then we can quit levying in Lakeville, which is affecting our property taxes and our business taxes. And for my community, that's an unhealthy environment. Thank you. John? I absolutely would oppose uh, the new Governor Dayton's uh, fourth tier tax uh, increase. Um, it's not likely that we're going to be able to repeal it with him in office. So that's why it's important if you uh, think that we're taxed enough um, that we elect true conservatives, not people that just come to the door and say that they're a conservative, but that they would actually do that. Um, I was also proud to introduce a bill that actually would lower the tax rates uh, in all the tiers, uh, all four tiers, not just the top tier, and to return our surplus to the taxpayers of Minnesota, and I'm proud of that. Thank you. We're going to go to a question from the audience. There's actually a couple of uh, questions that have come in related to the proposed private high-speed rail from the Twin Cities to Rochester. Um, they say there's no service for those affected communities that it runs through. What are, you, what are the views, what are your views um, based on this high-speed rail proposal? We'll start with Pat. You know, there are some bad ideas that are floating around out there, but this just might absolutely be the worst. Um, it is a profoundly stupid idea to have a high-speed rail line go from Rochester, uh, cutting right through the middle of our legislative district and go up to what is the airport. Um, the financing scheme doesn't work. It's never been used anywhere uh, in the world. It's a, such a bad idea that I can't even believe people are proposing it, but it's it's emblematic of sort of the mindless fact-free nature of some, uh, some people who come to the legislature with new and creative ways to spend your money. And again, I think it's a, it's a little bit uh, understated to say how bad of an idea it is. I'm very much opposed to it. And in fact, I chief author to build this legislative session to actually prohibit them from doing that. Marla? Well, I have to say I'm not that educated on, on that proposal, um, however, uh, transportation is is a huge issue in our area too there are many areas from our area down to Rochester that have no mode of transportation other than their cars so I like I say I would have to look into it more but but I'm out there talking to people in rural areas and they have no no way to get places so uh, you know, a, a new way of transportation. I would have to look at the at the dollars on it, but it, it could be useful to the area. Thank you, John. We'll go to you next. I would oppose the that particular plan. I'm also concerned not just with the cost and and the efficiency of it, but also the taking of property rights of those uh, people in Dakota County and along uh, Olmstead County, Goodhue County. Um, but more importantly, I, I guess I'd take my time and just to mention, you know, we're talking about transportation and uh, I was also proud in, in our bonding bill that passed both uh, the House and almost through the Senate until they messed it up with uh, their Southwest light rail provision, um, that we did include a bus rapid uh, transit um, funding for the Orange Line along I-35W. And I think those are the kind of modes that should be ex um, more useful than the high speed, uh, especially in the Rochester area, if you've been down there or come back, they have shuttle buses that run up and down um, 52 all day long anyway. So um, I'm proud of my work on the transportation bill and uh, no to high speed light rail. Yeah. Does the high speed light, I'm gonna start over. Can you repose the question for me? Certainly. The card reads, what is your view of the proposed private high-speed rail from the Twin Cities to Rochester 
with no service to the affected communities. What are those views based on? If there's no service, I think that's very ineffective. There is an opportunity to look at a good idea that has probably many flaws on the surface and say, oh, how are we going to make this work for us? We have access to world-class health care in the Rochester Mayo area. We have a wonderful downtown area. We have a workforce and lots of businesses in Lakeville. So the question is, how do we take an idea and make it work? How do we make it cost effective? How do we make sure we can pay for it and without debt? My family doesn't carry debt, and I don't believe our government should carry debt, our city or our school districts. And how do we do this? And it's going to take using a lot of different resources to accomplish it. But there is an opportunity here to meet our, senior ne our seniors' needs, our workers' needs, and our business needs. And I think we would be silly to just write it off. Thank you. Tim? I absolutely oppose the high-speed zip rail from Rochester to the Twin Cities. There are some people here in the audience at Farmington City Hall that would be affected dramatically by that. They're here to make sure that we do not go through and create an eminent domain situation on their personal property rights and their farmland. Enough said. Yeah, thank you. I'm opposed to the zip line from Rochester to Minneapolis. I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense for our district. I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense for this uh, southern Minnesota. Um, I do support uh, ex expanded investment in bus transit, however. I think that's the best economic choice. I want to go back and correct the record. Uh, you know, Council Member Pitcher stated that companies are fleeing the state because of our current tax scheme and business environment. But that has not been the Lakeville experience. We are moving dirt every single week. I am cutting a ribbon every single week. In 2015, that was our best year on record for commercial and industrial development. Uh, and so that has not been the experience of Lakeville. Um, but in talking with thousands of people in Farmington, they are worried about their property taxes and the lack of business in Farmington. We need someone that has the equation for success to bring business to this town. And that's improving infrastructure, that's messaging and letting businesses know how proud people are to be from Farmington and changing in tandem with some of the ordinances and zoning here in Farmington. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to our next question. We'll start with Leanne on this one. Would you support a bill preempting Minnesota cities and counties from imposing minimum wage rates or private sector benefits in excess of state and federal government requirements. Additionally, what would you provide as the appropriate rate for the minimum wage? Can you say that three times fast? <laughs> <laughs> I can repeat it once. All right, one time, repeat it. Would you support a bill preempting Minnesota cities and counties from imposing minimum wages or private sector benefits in excess of state and federal government regulations. Additionally, please provide any specifics related to what you believe the target minimum wage rate should be. There is concern about increasing the minimum wage for our Lakeville business owners. There are many of them who say that they can't support a $15 an hour minimum wage. And yet at the same time, we have people who make less than that that can't afford to live in Lakeville because of our lack of, of affordable housing. So what's happening in Lakeville is we have this Bermuda Triangle of no affordable housing, a minimum wage that if they're paid that, they can not afford to live there, and no public transportation. And my job is to represent Lakeville, what we need. My job is not to represent the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. My job is to represent Lakeville. And that's what I would do on those three issues. John? Uh, the Department of Labor and Industry says that more than half of the people earning a minimum wage are under the age of 24 years old. Uh, in terms of a minimum wage isn't designed to support a family of four. It's, it's an entry level job typically to gain uh, work experience and I do not support uh, a bill preempting city and counties um, or excuse me I would 
the minimum wage should should actually follow probably the federal minimum minimum wage, and cities and counties shouldn't be able allowed to um, choose their own uh, in a patchwork of of state policy making. Um, higher employee costs result in in a higher cost of goods and services, and this typically gets carried on to those that can least afford it in retail pricing. Um, so I wouldn't uh, support the preempting of city and counties. Matt? Okay. Well, I support the current law that's in place. I think it's uh, proper to allow businesses to adjust. I mean, the law was just uh, uh, completed at its, its peak wage in 2016. Um, I'd support indexing it to inflation so that it is not a political issue every single five or ten years or every year at this point. Um, so index it to inflation. Um, in terms of preempting um, cities and municipalities from making their own decision, uh, I think Councilmember Pitcher and I would agree that we hate uh, when the state or federal government tells us what we can and cannot do. And so uh, for me, uh, from my mayor perspective, I would, I would not pass a bill that would preempt cities and municipalities from doing what they think is best for their region. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I oppose the city and county separate minimum wage rates. And minimum wage going up, which initially, if you just look at it at the surface, it may seem like ooh, ah, but guess what? It's a job killer. And there's something called the hamburger index, where the price of hamburgers are usually about the same as a minimum wage. So if the minimum wage were supposed to, would go up to $15 an hour, would people really want to go out and pay $15 for a hamburger? Well, that's going to hurt businesses, and that's going to hurt jobs for the young people that are, need job experience before they get into their career. Thank you. Marla. Well, I, I would be against the, the preemptive um, portion of that. But as far as, uh, as, far as minimum wage, uh, it used to be entry level people. It's not anymore. It's mothers. It's people with kids. It's people that are trying to make a living. Uh, and the, the wages have been stagnant for a very long time. And nobody seems to be able to get businesses to start raising wages. It's barely beginning now, but I think that whole system needs to be shoved. It needs to be shoved up because people are sick of making the same while their companies make money year after year after year. Um, many of the companies that are so against this are, are not paying their people well. That's why they're against it. And I, um, the whole wage needs to go up. Pat? Well, I think I should get a little extra time here because I got to fact check some of the previous comments. Number one, first of all, um, Minnesota state law already has a minimum wage that adjusts for inflation upwards automatically. That's something that happened in the 2014 bill and it's already law. Second of all, council member Pitcher is 100% right. We are seeing wealth and equity leave our state of Minnesota. Uh, most recently, we saw a project of over $2 billion invested in the Sandpiper Pipeline that was completely killed. This would have provided thousands of high-paying union jobs for uh, local union shops in northern Minnesota, provided generous property tax revenue through growth, not through raising rates. So when Councilmember Pitcher highlights that concern, it's real. Uh, regarding this issue, the House of Representatives, we passed it this year. It is uh, a bad idea to force businesses to have separate tiers of minimum wage based on where they, what city they're in. Imagine you're an employer with employees in Minneapolis and Richfield, or perhaps they work between different sites. In addition to that complex web of regulations, it really is bad for job creation, and it sends a signal that we don't want to expand and prosper in our area. So I'm absolutely in favor of preemption. We should have one uniform minimum wage for the state of Minnesota, as we have right now. Thank you. Move on to another question from the audience, which is similar to one of the questions I had uh, prepared as well. And we will start with Tim on this question. What would you do to make Minnesota's education system the best in the na nation? And please also um, address the achievement gap as part of that solution. Yes, we need schools of excellence that prepare all kids that are ready to take on their career. And that absolutely needs to occur. 
And here's a little quick fact. Farmington has about the lowest achievement gap in the entire state of Minnesota. So it's real. That needs to be corrected. And we need to support and actually be able to have school choice. And wouldn't it be great if the taxpayer dollars actually followed the child, no matter if they went to public school, private school, religious school, charter school, it shouldn't matter. Thank you. Matt? Thank you. It sounds like Representative Garofalo and I will have a separate debate after this debate, and we'll take care of a couple issues then. Uh, is that all right, Representative? All right, no answer. Um, <laughs> there are four things that I am going to highlight in terms of addressing the achievement gap and also improving our education system to be not only the best in the nation, but the best in the world. The first is we do have to make targeted investments in pre-K funding. If a student shows up to kindergarten or first grade uh, and they don't have basic reading skills, they're going to fall further and further behind. So let's target uh, some scholarships or grant money uh, to communities that need the help and, and need to get ready for kindergarten. The second is we continue to need to modify our testing and adjust how much we're testing and when the test results come out um, so that teachers are able to use it in, in a, an immediate fashion. Uh, third, we need to continue to attack class sizes and keep those reducing so people and I mean so teachers have the time to address student needs. Uh, finally, we need uh, the money from St. Paul that's coming down to our local school districts to not have as many mandates as they do now so that there's innovation and people are able, time's up, people are able to uh, use the money as they see fit in their district. Thank you. John? Can you repeat the question again, please? Certainly. What would you do to make Minnesota's education system the best in the nation? And please also address the issues regarding the achievement gap. Great. Uh, one of the issues that I think we need to do, uh, we hear a lot about, is uh, testing in the schools. They do testing that they don't get the results back until the student is in the next grade. And it's um, probably too late at that point. So we, I would encourage uh, less testing, but more effective testing. Uh, the pre K uh, scholarships, uh, th the governor uh, wants to uh, have all day pre K or universal pre K. And I, I don't agree with that, but I do agree with uh, the Republicans' plan to have scholarships to the targeted areas of the communities that uh, need it uh, the most. And that would also is an important uh, factor to reduce the achievement gap for many of our minority students. I had the honor to. Uh, tour one of the premier private high schools, Cristo Rey in Minneapolis, and uh, they work um, out with average uh, C students uh, that come from uh, challenging backgrounds, and they have high expectations and achieve 100% graduation rates. I think a lot of the things that they do there uh, can be trans uh, worked into uh, the public school system as well, and also reducing unfunded manda mandates. Thank you. Leanne? I am a 23-year teacher. I am this year's 2016 Elementary Educator of Excellence. I'm very proud of that. I was awarded that by my peers and my constituents. I would love to believe that my opponent would do what he says for education, but him and his constituents have failed our students for decades. A decade. I'll take back three of those decades. The last decade, our schools have been underfunded. The mandates have been strong, our tax dollars have been wasted, and it's all in the pretense of holding teachers accountable. Our students are being over-tested, it's not effective, and we need voices for our students in our education system. It's time to have an educator helping advise. My opponents once told me that he knew education. And you know what? I have a husband who's an electrician. I couldn't wire a house. And I believe it's time to have educators advising education. And that's what I would do. Thank you. Pat, we'll move on to you. Well, again, stated agenda, real agenda. Uh, the stated agenda is to provide services for those in preschool targeted need. Absolute bipartisan support on that. But what are the Democrats in favor of and what are they advocating? The program and assistance only being available in government-run schools. Why? They're unionized. By having unionized government-run preschools, what you do is you completely destroy the private sector system of child care and preschool operations. So the stated agenda of helping kids, there's bipartisan agreement on it. But why is it that Democrats are insisting 
on having it be through government sectors only in the government-run institutions. Uh, I believe a much better model for preschool is like we have in the higher education level. We give the scholarships to the students or the parents, and then they're able to choose either a public or private school to attend that best serves their needs. Unfortunately, what we're seeing now is that uh, they want a tra uh, an effort by Democrats to trap low income and poor people into a government run system. Uh, I think it's better to have competition. I think we need more of that competition, particularly in failing schools at our K-12 level, and that's why I've supported scholarships and vouchers to allow for them. Marla? Uh, well, a uh, great way to call a school something that sounds awful, a government run institution. Um, we call it a school and kids go there because that's where we concentrate our money and that's what we have done as a state to provide our kids education. We do need to do uh, less testing because that is not an effective way of teaching. Um, we need to give money to enough money to our schools so they can reduce class sizes because that makes them more effective. That makes teachers better, that makes students better. We need to invest in pre-K because that will close the achievement gap and that will get kids ready for school earlier. Uh, we need to really get the most out of our dollar to our schools. Uh, by shortchanging them for over 10 years, we have given them large class sizes and, and testing uh, like crazy, and that has not worked. Um, for our final question, um, we're going to just ask for just a one word answer because we're limited on our time. And I know you can all just pick one of these three, right? Absolutely. We will start with Pat on this. Do you believe Minnesota's business taxes are too high, about right, or too low? Uh, they're too high, and that's why we should, uh, the governor should call us back in a special session to pass the tax relief bill that we passed out of both the House and Senate. Marla? Was this supposed to be a one word answer? Marla? About right. John? Minnesota taxes, business taxes are too high. Leanne? I believe they're about right. Tim? Hi. And Matt? We've got a lot of work to do, but Minnesota is seeing a lot of success right now. <laughs> this, let, uh, let, me, no. let, let me just explain. It, no, this, no, no. this is no. the type, <laughs> this, is the, <laughs> this is the exact type of question Matt, which is destroying our politics. You. There are more decisions Matt, than just three. No, we're thank done you. with the question. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. We'll move to closing comments now. And we will start <clears throat> with Leanne. One minute, please. It's time to do this different. It's time that we make a change. It's time to have public servants versus politicians and party politics. It's time to have someone who's willing to work for our community. Listen to them, do what they ask, and represent them. It's time to have an educator advocating for our students and not mortgage bankers and business people. Education is our future. And it's time to reinvest in that. And it's time to quit using party politics to hold back our 21st century workforce and to put the burden of it on our kids. I'm ready to be that person. My slogan is, Weichel like works, you'll actually see the difference. And I stand by that. Thank you. John? Okay. Uh, I'm proud of the profession that I have in the 21 years that I've had in mortgage and real estate and helping thousands of families with their family budget. So I take offense to that a little bit. I don't need the elitist uh, commentary there. Um, there is also a very well representation in the Capitol with uh, the Education Minnesota. In fact, the chair of the uh, one of the education committees is a former teacher. But nonetheless, um, I've, I know firsthand the impacts of increasing taxes and burdens on family budgets and their lives and their jobs. And it's an important perspective that's lacking in the legislature. The real, um, real world experience and understanding of the private sector. 
So over the last two years, Republicans were able to stop the Democrats' attempted increases on the gas tax, sales tax, payroll taxes, and extension of health care, all to continue to grow more and more government. And when I'm knocking at the doors, my constituents in Lakeville, both Democrats, Republicans, and independents, appreciate that I'm trying to make their lives easier by reducing the burden of government. Thank you. Marla? In my job, I have been negotiating for 16 years. I know how to do that. I know how to take people's wishes, cares, concerns, and go to St. Paul, sit down with whoever is across the table, and get a good common sense answer. I have been talking to people too, and they are sick of gridlock. They've seen it on a national level, now they're seeing it on a state level, and they're not happy about that. They're not happy that things didn't get done. And I get stuff done. That is what I have been doing for a long time. I have uh, negotiated tens of millions of dollars in contracts. We have to close the deal to do what's right for the people in our area, and that is what I am committed to doing. So I really want to be the representative for this area because I am listening and I am talking to people and they are saying they want to change. Thank you, Pat. Well, thank you to the chamber and thanks to the candidates for participating. You know, believe it or not, it's not always easy getting up in front of people talking about these issues. So uh, thanks for everyone for participating. I think going forward, what's important is to realize that we want reasonableness and consensus in our government. We do not want to have one party in total control. And while I respect the fact that some people can say, well, they're just a, they're a little liberal, they're still liberals. <laughs> and what you want is you want to have both parties sitting at the table. You want to have management and labor working together to find consensus and reasonableness on these plans. We saw from two years ago when the Democrats had a total control, it did not work. And it's bad for Minnesota going into the future. Let's have that reasonableness. Let's make sure that Mark Dayton has a check in the legislature by having either the House or the Senate, or perhaps both the House and the Senate, work with the governor to have a common sense, reasonable approaches. Again, thanks for everyone for being here tonight and look forward to hanging out and talking with people afterwards. Thank you, Pat. Matt? Thank you, and again, thank you for the chamber, uh, to the chamber for putting this on and allowing us this great opportunity to talk with viewers and the folks that are here. Um, well, you heard what I had flagged earlier on. We're gonna hear a lot about labels and parties and blame. And I think the, you know, the last question really fits into what I'm talking about, right? You want, you want us to choose from two answers or three answers, uh, but that's not how it should work in St. Paul. There's a lot of options. We need to be working together to find the common ground. And our politics right now sets us up, tries to box us in on this side or that side, and that's exactly what's preventing us from working together. Um, so if you want a guy that's going to go up there and blame the other party uh, and use a lot of labels and uh, name call, I'm not your guy. Please do not vote for me. But if you want someone that's going to go up there and swing every single day for our communities here in Senate District 58, Lakeville, Farmington, and the surrounding area, grow jobs, improve our infrastructure, rebuild the world-class education system, I'm your guy. Thank you. And Tim? Well, I want to sincerely thank the Dakota County Chamber of Commerce for holding this. In voting for me, Tim Pitcher, you're voting for a guy who is definitely not a career politician nor have I had the desire to be a politician. I'm a problem solver. My statement for many decades is see it, own it, do it. And taxes are too high. Companies are leaving the state. I know from real world experience, my job of 17 years went to Ireland. I had to go to Ireland to train engineers, technicians, operators on high-tech microelectronics knowing my job was going to Ireland because of taxes. This is real-world world experience we're talking about, multiple decades. I'm not doing this for me. I have no ego to build whatsoever. I've volunteered for thousands of hours in the community and in churches. Please check out my website, timothypitcher.com. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. On behalf of the Dakota County Regional Chamber, my thanks to each of the candidates for taking the time to share a bit more about yourselves and your views on issues important to this region. 
Thank you to the City of Farmington for hosting us. Thanks as well to the live audience members for being here and to our viewers at home. We hope you feel a bit more educated on the issues and become engaged in this important process. The candidate forum is available through replay on Apple Valley, Farmington, and Rosemount Cable Commission Channel 188, as well as at www.dcrchamber.com. While you're on our website, also take a peek at our 2016 Local Voter Guide. Finally, don't forget to vote on November 8th. Thanks again to the candidates and have a great evening.